All right, well, thank you. All right, so let's just get right into it here. I'll begin with an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so I'll begin with some background information about uh, Exotica and come up with a definition and, uh, and connect the concept of Exotica to valuation and social value and how we recognize value in the archeological record. Uh, I'll talk about obsidian sourcing studies and, uh, and use a case study from the uh, Neolithic Central Mediterranean to explore the idea of Exotica. So I, I've selected a couple sites here uh, where we, the criteria might be met. Uh, Corsica, southern France, Siberia, and uh, Apulia in, in Italy. And then hopefully uh, we'll end off a discussion about uh, you know, the idea of obsidian as exotica and uh, hopefully end up with some conclusions from all of that. So we'll start with the definition here. I'll, I'll take a definition from uh, Tycott, 2011. Uh, exotica, something non-native or foreign which has been imported and appreciated by the receiving culture. So we have a couple parts here, right? Uh, this imported uh, being part of the definition and appreciated as well. Uh, and we'll kind of explore whether, you know, what, what that means. I'll take a work from uh, Giro, uh, 1989, uh, defining value and what makes the artifact valuable. Uh, rarity is one uh, tenant. Uh, something that's rare tends to be more valuable. Uh, artifact size, uh, things that are larger than, than usual uh, tend to be valued. Uh, artifact longevity, so something that is in, in circulation for long periods of time uh, has more opportunity for value to be embedded within it. Uh, and the last uh, two are all about uh, how difficult something is to produce. So something more difficult to produce is valued more because people appreciate uh, its uh, craftsmanship. Uh, obsidian, uh, volcanic glass, uh, an igneous rock uh, that's found throughout the world. Uh, it's an ideal raw material for stone tool creation. Uh, but of course, it also serves other ritual and uh, symbolic functions as well. Due to their distinct physical properties, obsidian can be sourced to the geological outcrops from which they originate. Uh, obsidian sourcing. And uh, from there, a number of questions can be addressed. Uh, a whole range of questions. Uh, obsidian sourcing studies are found worldwide. Uh, here's a, a, a brief list of some uh, from the past decade or so. Uh, well over 100 from every uh, context around the world. So some issues that are addressed through obsidian sourcing, uh, questions about procurement, uh, identity, uh, social identity, uh, movement of people, colonization events and so forth, and uh, lastly, cultural contact. Uh, and this is where this concept of exotica comes in. Uh, cultural contact, interaction between different groups of people, uh, particularly in, in situations where there's exchange going on. Uh, and that's really where exotica is, it fits in. It's about social interaction and contact. So some studies uh, around the world, where, where, where they come from. Uh, you know, lots of studies uh, in Oceania exploring the concept of exotica uh, as a proxy for, for interaction. Uh, in the central Mediterranean, when we talk about obsidian as exotica, it's usually exploring uh, things at the tail end of exchange networks. So at the very ends of the distribution of various obsidian sources. Uh, so lots of obsidian sources in the Mediterranean, uh, the Carpathian, uh, a little farther north, uh, sources in the Aegean, uh, central Turkey. Uh, there is evidence of a couple sites in northern Italy where uh, Carpathian source uh, material makes their way uh, over there. Uh, one possible piece of Melian obsidian in northern Italy, a uh, site of Bruno de Leone. But in general, uh, most of the obsidian that we find in the central Mediterranean comes from uh, these four West Mediterranean sources. Uh, so we have Monte Archi, uh, Sardinia, Calarola, Lipari, and Pantelleria. You know, the four sources that were utilized in central Mediterranean prehistory. The beginnings of obsidian use correspond with the spread of agriculture and uh, Neolithic societies from the Near East. Uh, around the 6th millennia BC, we first see uh, obsidian use and, uh, and long distance exchange coming about. Here's a, a diagram here of Neolithic sites where obsidian has been reported. Uh, over 500 sites here. Uh, found throughout uh, Sardinia, Corsica, throughout Italy, uh, France, North Africa, Sicily, all over the place, uh, likely being 
exchanged through models of, of down the line exchange and redistribution along uh, the maritime coastal uh, routes. When I'm talking about Neolithic society here, um, I'm talking about small scale farming societies, uh, very little evidence of formal social hierarchies. And importantly here, obsidian is, is typically found in residential contexts. It's most often found in, in the village uh, context themselves. Some artistic renderings. When obsidian is used, it's, uh, uh, it's used to create uh, flake-based tools, or, or common artifact form in Sardinia, Corsica. Uh, and pressure flake blades are also very common, uh, being found throughout mainland Italy, uh, southern France, uh, all over the place. These are the two most common artifact uh, forms. So that's just a background to uh, setting the context for everything. So let's uh, explore a couple of uh, examples. This figure here shows the distribution of Libri obsidian. So Libri is the source here. Uh, you can see it has a very long or large distribution, uh, the largest of any of the four sources, uh, being found thousands of kilometers away uh, from the source itself. Uh, and one of the sites uh, that's kind of at the tail end, I guess, of this network is the site of uh, Kesha Vidona. Uh, there are only two sites where obsidian uh, from Leafery has been reported on Corsica. And of course, uh, this site is uh, the farthest away. And again, this, this concept of the tail end of these networks uh, are where we're most likely to find Exotica. So work by uh, Laborde Net et al. Uh, studied obsidian from this site. Uh, it's a page of the final Neolithic. And this is what was found here. A block of Leafery obsidian, uh, very poor napping quality. Uh, running roughly, roughly two and a half kilograms. Most of the obsidian we find of leapery origin is of final products of pressure flake blades. Uh, finding any kind of uh, primary material outside of leapery is highly unusual, particularly of this size. Uh, and in this context, right, its, its importance may have been unrelated to stone tool production. Uh, this is not going to be an ideal raw material for producing uh, pressure flake blades of the style that's being produced. Uh, you know, so questions um, emerge from that. Why and how did it get there? And, and who was the one, I, I guess, you know, appreciating it uh, in that context? The uh, authors argue that it provides evidence for the occasional contact between members of different socioeconomic systems. And, and this is a theme that we're going to see here is that when when exotica is invoked, it's all, uh, it's about cultural contact between different groups of people. Here's the uh, Pantelleria distribution. Uh, the island of Pantelleria here uh, has a pretty limited distribution to Sicily and North Africa. A couple of uh, anomalies, and particularly one anomaly is the site of San Sebastian in uh, southern France. Uh, a real outlier in where you're going to find Pantelleria obsidian. It's not Neolithic, but I, I had to include it. Uh, it's a Copper Age burial site. Uh, worked by William Storp et al. in 1984. Uh, two arrowheads of Pantelleria obsidian, whose greenish hue may have been a factor in its appeal. Uh, Pantelleria is unique in that it's paralkaline and green, has a greenish hue to it. Uh, highly unusual to find uh, arrowheads as well. Uh, very unusual to find arrowheads. Uh, anywhere in mainland Italy or, or mainland France as well. The authors argue that one of the questions raised by this work is that of the routes by which obsidian reached southern France from the island sources. Monte Archie, uh, Sardinian uh, sources. Uh, I'll focus on two here at the tail ends. Uh, we have the site of Poulo di Mofetta and a number of sites in Iberia, actually very near where we are right now. And, and very different things going on in these two contexts. Uh, in Iberia, uh, this is work by uh, Tiradas et al. 2014, who did the, the study of these materials and, and uh, collated them. Uh, we have middle Neolithic burial sites at La Serreta, uh, Bobila Madurel, Bobila Padro, and the Verisite mine of Gava. In total, there are five pressure flake blades and a pressure flake core, all from the SA subsource of Monte Archie. So on Monte Archie, there are multiple subsources. Uh, all from one singular one, which is in keeping with the pattern in southern France. Uh, SA materials are distinguished by their transparency when compared with any uh, other source. 
And I would argue that the presence of finely crafted pressure flake blades in multiple burials within a restricted territory suggests a shared cultural understanding of their value. Uh, the presence of an associated core even may suggest that the production of these objects was part of a funerary ritual, a uh, performance similar to what was occurring in early Cycladic Greece, uh, a term that's been called necrolithic, uh, where we have funerary ritual very directly connected to the production of pressure plate blades. It may be what is occurring here in uh, Iberia. A very different story uh, comes from Pool di Molfetta in uh, southeastern Italy. We have middle Neolithic, uh, middle to late Neolithic site, uh, worked by Aquafreda and Tony. What was found here is a single bladelet uh, weighing 0.5 grams and attributed to the SC subsource of Monte Archie. Black Sardinian obsidian is not uh, always visually distinguishable from leafery raw materials, which are very common in this area. So I would argue that objects like this may not have been even recognized as something exotic. Uh, there, nothing about their visual properties uh, makes that readily apparent. And there's really nothing exceptional about this artifact itself. Uh, the authors argue, though, that it highlights trans-Apennine exchange networks between the Mediterranean and uh, Adriatic coasts. So what can we get from all of this here? Uh, obviously, some patterns here uh, in, in how the literature discusses obsidian as exotica. Uh, they mostly focus around its role as a marker of social interaction uh, and as a means of reconstructing exchange networks. Interesting questions nevertheless emerge when focus is, on pla is placed on how value was constructed in the prehistoric past and on how that may have differed through time and space. So I think this is something we can uh, work on a little more. Uh, the construction of value can occur at the individual level based on a person's lived experience. So uh, I think an example, the Corsica example is a good example of this, where that big block may have been appreciated as a, maybe as a token from someone's journeys uh, and, and travels around, as opposed to something that a, a village or something uh, rallied around or, or, or were aware of. But of course, at a broader level, uh, you can have shared cultural understandings uh, of something of value which I think it comes from Iberia, where we see the same pattern emerging from multiple sites. While it may seem that long distance exchange items would have an inherent social value, uh, archeologists must appreciate that Neolithic groups, due to their sedentary nature, would have a much more localized geographic knowledge, to the point to which an object from 100, 100 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers away uh, might have been equally exotic. And it would take a real uh, knowledge of, of the territory to understand you know, distance in the same way. And we're talking about sedentary groups of, of agro-pastoralists. Some conclusions, uh, obsidian is a highly adaptable raw material. Uh, it serves important uh, functions that extend beyond just uh, the utilitarian. The concept of exotica is useful in this context because it necessi necessitates an engagement with uh, questions about why objects were transported over vast distances in the prehistoric past and how they were integrated and reimagined in societies on the outer bounds of long-distance exchange networks. In this discussion, examples that I've discussed come from sites where obsidian's value is connected to its size and eccentricity, uh, such as uh, Corsica and uh, southern France, and from contexts where finely made artifacts are associated with human interments and possibly performative ritual. However, just because something is rare does not necessarily mean it was appreciated as such. And I think that's something important here uh, when we tie in that definition of uh, exotica itself. Thank you.